Actually, we should move this over here. So, oh, he glued it down. Good. All right. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hey. Welcome Hi. to Mid Camp, your first session. Right? Yeah. First session? Okay, good. Um, so, I'm Chris Urban. This is Jeff Gerling. Right here. Um, he and I work at Acquia. Um, you're in a local development for dummies. Uh, this is a session we kind of threw together, and we're presenting it for the first time. Um, uh, so we'll appreciate feedback and questions at the end of our presentation. All right. Uh, so let us take a minute and introduce ourselves. Jeff, go first. Uh, I'm from St. Louis, and in St. Louis, I am one of the many co co meetup organizers for the St. Louis Drupal Users Group. I started using Drupal in 2008, so it's been 10 years now, and uh, everything has changed so much since then. So. This is, a, from probably five or six years ago on, I've been deeply involved in local development environment stuff. And at Acquia, while it has nothing to do with any of the things that I am billable for, I do a lot of work on local development environments and team-based team, team -based development, things like that. So that's kind of my background on this session. Um, I'm the counterpart to Jeff. I'm not nearly as awesome as him, but I'm from the project management side. Different. So, different. Uh, different awesome. Um, I'm one of the co-organizers of Drupal Delphia, which is a little camp in Philadelphia, which we're actually still opening, set, uh, accepting sessions today, so if you have any interest in presenting, talk to me afterwards. Um, as a project management guy, I'm a Jira nerd by default, and um, I'm also a little bit, um, I let's say I used to be a developer. I dabble in it a little bit. Um, so I have a, an interest in this as well, uh, just because one of the questions that often comes up at camps is, what do you use? What do you do? Um, and, oops, did it time out? And um, so that's why, we, that's why we started this session. So uh, questions, why are you here? You want something to do before lunch. You think that, what was my joke? You heard about Composer, but you're tone deaf. Your uh, outrigger is stuck in the lagoon. OK, enough bad jokes. The real answer is you're a Drupal developer. You know you should be deploying a test of code to production, but you don't have a local environment you feel confident in. So there's so many choices out there, and you don't know where to start. And Docker and Vagrant, and oh my. So that's really why you're here, right? OK. So let's talk first, uh, before we answer that question, who are we? Because the question you can only answer, what should you be using for your local Drupal environment? It depends. What do you do? Are you a developer? Are you a site builder? Are you working by yourself? Are you working with a team? Uh, are you on Windows? Are you on Mac? Where are you? So to answer that question, you may have seen, uh, we put out on Twitter a couple weeks ago, a survey. And this survey is to find out uh, what you use for your environment uh, with a couple of other anonymous questions like where are you located, what do you do, who do you work with. That URL still works and we're going to continue taking responses up to DrupalCon, but for all intents and purposes this is really the first time we're releasing all of this info. Um, and this will answer the question who you are and that will let us give you some direction about what we think are some good development scenarios for you. So first thing we're going to do is go through some of the results. We'll take a couple minutes here. So be prepared for awesome statistics. Uh, we're actually up to 744. I can't keep up with this. Um, we're up to over 700 submissions from over 60 countries, which is fantastic. We've got representation from every continent. The last one that's not labeled is Africa. Um, obviously uh, dominated by the United States and Europe. I kind of expected that. I didn't expect to get a good uh, representative sample from other countries. Um, so we're very pleased by that. Um, aside from the US, because otherwise the skew of the chart gets out of whack, you can kind of see where we're getting um, survey results from. Um, so a pretty decent scattering around. And that's only in two weeks. Um, without the U.S., the top ten, uh, not, again, not surprising, English-speaking countries, Ireland and the United Kingdom. Oh, it blanked out again. Uh, followed by the rest of uh, the most populated Euro uh, European countries and Canada. Um, they make up the um, top ten, and like I said, the list keeps going and going and going. Um, uh, if you're interested in details later, let me know and I can tell you. Within the United States, again, 
most populous states, kind of where you expect everybody to be, um, all the way down to where I'm from, Pennsylvania, and uh, where is... I'm a little bit of a... You're a little ahead of me. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, again, no surprise there. So, one of the questions we asked was, well, what kind of types of projects are you working on? Drupal 8, mostly Drupal 8, little 7, mostly 7, little 6, and this kind of breaks it out. I'm, I'm in, really intrigued by most by these two, the highest proportion of all eight projects in Asia and Oceania. Oceania is uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, all those little Philippines, uh, all that stuff out there. And Asia includes India. Um, but within the US and Europe, this is a really nice number. This is telling me that we have, I think, was it 80%, 90? Oh, what was my, oh, I can't see my speaker notes. Um, 80 or 90% is um, Drupal 8 solidly, mostly or all Drupal 8, which is great news because we've heard before about the slow adoption rate of Drupal 8. This is telling me that's not exactly true. There is still uh, room for improvement, but the majority of the time that we're spending is on Drupal 8. And you'll see that one outlier in red over there is the one guy that's working on Drupal 6. <laughs> um, the other question we had was about the size of the Drupal team. Now, this is a tricky question because I asked about the number of developers that do Drupal, meaning you, you and somebody, you and a bunch of others, you and a whole a Drupal army. And again, the vast majority is you work in teams of five or less. Those are the two blue colors. And then the scattering goes all the way out to 50 plus. And there's a handful, not insignificant, but a handful that are in those large, large teams. But predominantly, this kind of reinforces the notion that this, this question is really hitting a nerve because these are folks that are working with maybe one other person. And those are the two, that's your very small feedback loop for trying and testing new things out. So with this survey, hopefully you will learn some of the tools that you may not be aware of, reinforce the decisions you've made, maybe encourage you to try something else. Other dev team, this is to kind of cover, well, maybe I work in a small group in a small agency. I kind of imagine two Drupal developers, maybe a front ender, maybe a JavaScript specialist, maybe there's a DBA because there's a guy that does .NET, I don't know. But this kind of answers that question, and the black is none. So this really, for me, reinforces, yeah, they are predominantly solo or pairs that are working in Drupal. You want to talk about this one? This is my favorite. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting because I know in the past the few, there haven't been a whole lot of these kind of surveys, which is kind of sad because it's hard to see historical data, but I... I remember when PHP Storm was something that like the only people that would ever use it are people that came from like Java to PHP and back five, six years ago that was a very small number of people but ever since Drupal 8 came out uh, and Drupal 8 is based on Symfony and, and has a lot more components that require more of an IDE to build things really easily. I mean all the other tools can work with it great but PHP Storm was like set up for it and got tons of uptake. So it's the clear victor at this point if you're looking for a good development tool for, for Drupal 8 code. Uh, but it's Sublime Text, which has been super popular for years, is still kind of holding its ground, but seems to be slowly uh, withering down from the next three, which are Visual Studio Code, Vim, and uh, Atom. Uh, a bunch of other tools out there. It's, it's interesting, a lot of developers will just find a tool, learn it, and then use it for life, basically. So, you know, there's people using, uh, using BBEdit and some other tools which are, they're still updated, they're still valid, but um, they don't have a lot of the cutting edge things that made them amazing back when they first came out. Yeah, there was one other interesting thing here uh, as well. It, we correlated this back to the team size and location and uh, project types. And overwhelmingly, obviously you see Europe at 73%, but the PHP Storm users, overwhelming the one and two person groups. So that is even more uh, like the redefining that these guys have, I don't want to call it a monopoly, but a pretty pretty strong uh, grip on it. The larger teams are the ones that are using that second tier, Sublime, Vim, Visual Studio, and Atom. Notepad and On, those are like the outliers. Those are also predominantly uh, Europe, Oceania, and Asia. Uh, I guess they, you know, like writing in the terminal. Uh, 
QA methodology. So now this is the first of a couple questions that we left the other open answers uh, uh, allowed. And actually, this is not showing my the two answers at the bottom, which are luck slash wing slash prayer <laughs> and wraith tests. Um, they're down at the long tail uh, at the end. But if you can't read those, I'll, I'll read this down because this is worth mentioning. Um, the number one is developer does own tests far and away. And um, that is also um, overwhelmingly, uh, it's overwhelmingly popular across the board. The next group down, which is peer review, the architect does code review, or you rely on a QA team. Um, that's generally consistent. Asia, much, much higher than the rest on those categories. And then the rest is filled in by fill in the blanks. And those really kind of run the, uh, run the gamut. Automated testing and linting are at the top. Continuous integration tools, PHP code sniffer, client reviews, so you're letting your customer do your QA, brilliant. Um, the hat tests, PHP unit tests, code standards, sonar cube, circle CI, PHP mess detector, uh, BLT, and then like I mentioned at the end, wraith and uh, luck wing prayer. <laughs> My, they quote, dumb luck, just wing it, let's do it live, <laughs> Ship it if it works. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. It compiles. It compiles. Ship it. Um, you want to talk about this one? Yeah. So that I actually wrote a blog post on this topic a couple of years ago, um, talking about Vagrant in particular. But uh, what some people don't realize getting into the Drupal community, especially if you've been in a shop that didn't do Drupal before and is getting into it or something, or a, a lot of PHP or a lot of PHP projects, uh, the culture is incredibly focused on Mac, Linux, uh, Unixy, Linuxy based environments. And this survey kind of just reinforces that. There's there's been more more and more uptake of Windows ten as Windows ten now has the Windows subsystem for Linux which really makes Windows 10 actually like usable with some of the tools that are required to do modern development. Um, but like, there's still a lot of people using Windows 7, Windows 8, and things like that, which are harder. Um, but the point that I had in my blog post was, you know, it's, it's an uphill battle when you're not using a Mac or a Linux computer operating system just because everyone else doesn't. So you're going to have to find out all your own problems and research all your own solutions. And, you know, I, I try to document what I can, but I don't use Windows daily. So, and there's very few people who are like me who also have a Windows laptop even to test something out for you. So, just uh, uh, so one note: uh, the scale across the bottom is like a total percentage because these were one or more choices. Uh, so you could pick, let's say, all three uh, of the top three, but this should give you some relative scale that just between Mac and Linux, how how much more room Windows 10 has to grow or hopefully stays put. But the Windows 7, five lines, six lines down, that is really trailing off, which is, for us, this is a great sigh of relief. Um, I was also surprised that Arch is so small because the Arch users are so vocal and I won't say annoying, but <laughs> compared to the other Linux users. So tell me how you feel about Bash. Okay. Um, all right, so now the next two is the same grouping, but now broken out by region and then by project type, so that you can kind of see Mac is kind of evenly um, spread out. It's evenly popular. Uh, whereas, let's say, looking at Windows 10, this is much more popular in uh, Africa and uh, Oceania, Pro way out of proportion. If you look at the purple, purple, purple. They're very even, as opposed to this, which is kind of representative of the total. What does the percents mean? The uh, it's total, like the number of respondents who picked it, but it's the aggregate. I wanted to divide to show a representation within the group. So if, if I had 1,000 submissions and I got 1,000 people responding, uh, that was 100. So basically, four times the population. Um, yeah, I, it, don't look at the bottom. <laughs> um, it's the scale of the the scale of the color bands. That's what I'm trying to convey. Um, yeah, yeah, right. So then, by project, um, here's what's interesting: is you see uh, overwhelmingly for uh, mostly Drupal, and again all Drupal. But then you come down here, and you see like Linux, other, and Windows. Nobody's doing 
Drupal 7, they're still doing 7, not as much 8, right? So um, it's not even. That's, that's the point. Um, yeah, so this will be the same thing. Um, so this is the other question, and this was a little confusing, I think. Now, going back, I would probably rewrite this a little bit different. Uh, the screen went down again. Um, so we asked, what do you use for your local dev technology? And the question really was, uh, did it again? Oh, bummer. Um, it was a couple of questions up front, and then um, there's another question where I give the sample um, solutions. We're trying to keep it broad. The questions we provided were, uh, the answers we provided were, I don't know, uh, custom Docker, custom Vagrant, or the local um, operating system. So, wow. Oh, maybe. Oops. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Nope. nope. I, I reported it to the okay. center staff. Yeah, I don't think it's this guy. No, no, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. It's power. Um, okay, sorry. So we just asked custom Docker, custom Vagrant, um, and I think that was it. Um, the rest of the suggestions were. I think this is the right one, right? Yeah. I think I think we had a list of like the, the ones that are capitalized. Yeah, we're in our list. The other ones were write and answers, maybe. Yes, that's it. That's right. So, for example, I don't know that we, I don't remember that we had Vlad or Valet um, or Lagoon, but we had Eager and Homebrew and Outrigger, Doxol. This was not in our list. This was a Fury on Twitter. What the hell? You forgot Doxol. Um, <laughs> I can see if anybody's paying attention. Um, Dev Desktop, Lando, and Kellbox, and Drupal VM. Um, but again, this this is the this is the money slide right here, just to see what everybody was responding. The top six, uh, Custom Vagrant and Custom Docker, Dev Desktop, MAMP, surprise, uh, Drupal VM, and Lando Calbox. Those are solidly like, the top <coughs> tier of solutions that everybody's using. Then there's like the middle group, and then there's a lot of, there's a lot more outliers. Anything that I had like just one response for, I, you know, I, I wouldn't fit on the slide basically. I try to consolidate as much as, as we could. Um, and I think this one we break out also, yeah by region, and then by project also, because this is interesting. For example, nobody's using Outrigger for anything other than, or Doxel for anything other than me. Not a surprise. No, but this one is the regional one. That's the regional one. Yeah, yeah, USA, Europe, and all that. Oh, right, right. So nobody outside the US is using Outrigger, or DDEV, or what was the other one that was very heavy? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the other ones are pretty much, um, uniformly scattered across all, all regions. Uh, when we get to the projects, that should be the next one. There we go. Yeah. So solid, the mostly Drupal 8, some Drupal 7, those are the ones that are filling in the top three, the Docker, Lando, and Drupal VM. The proportion, again, for Doxol and DDEV, and a, uh, Docker for Drupal and Acre are really um, surprising how much there is in, in those groups. Okay, um, now uh, just a note, I've got like, there was a, a, at least another half dozen slides that Jeff and I decided to forget it because it's just way too many numbers and pretty colors. They really get into the hardcore statistics nitty gritty. If you've got questions or you're just curious, want to let me know, happy to answer and pull up other slides to show you after the session. But we want to make sure we have enough time to talk the real meat and potatoes, which is, okay, let's now take what we've learned and turn it into pretend people asking the question, what should I do for my local development environment? So what we've come up with, you know, I can do it, you can do it. Yeah. Uh, what, I, what I think our, our main goal of this session was, like, in 2018, if you're a certain type of person, developer, site builder, or something, what is the best option? And we want to try to give that to you so that you can go there and instead of spending, like like I do sometimes, hours in a day trying like, out seven or eight different solutions, completely blowing up your computer <laughs> and then trying to get it back to a fresh state so you can try another few solutions. And then at the end of it, like Chris mentioned earlier, you're totally confused and you hate Drupal all of a sudden. Um, 
So we came up with these four personas that I think cover a pretty wide variety of people that, that I interact with at least and cover a lot of the people that we saw on the slides in the you know the, the one to two person teams and that kind of thing. Um, and uh, just running through quick, some of these are a little controversial if you're another person who develops a local development environment, but um, uh, for the site builder persona, this is like somebody who puts together a Drupal website or might build some different brochure type sites or things like that. Um, or even like a person like Chris, sometimes when he's working on evaluating a project or something, he just needs a Drupal site running on his laptop and he wants to do some things or play around or something like that. Or it's like Drupal, Drupal Philadelphia or Drupal, Drupal Delphia. whatever that thing is. Like if he needs to do some work on it, he might need to run it on his, on his desk or on his laptop but he doesn't necessarily want to spend a lot of time customizing it, tweaking it, making it high performance and all that. And the recommendation we have is Acquia Dev Desktop, which is like MAMP or WAMP, uh, but it, it basically gets you a local environment and a Drupal site on your computer with like a few button clicks, which is really helpful if you're trying to get something up and running quick or if it's the first time you're ever using Drupal. Um, or if you're a little more adventurous, like if you're like Chris and you have a little more technical knowledge and you want to get a little deeper into it, you can try out something like Doxel or Orlando or something like that. Uh, follow the Getting Started Guide and go through it. See, um, see if it's, I mean, some of those tools have more flexibility and, and might have some features you need. Uh, so one caveat I want to be clear, uh, yes, we are both from Acquia, and now I'm saying Acquia Dev Desktop, you're you know, obviously inclined to be cynical and conspiracy theorist and say, oh, this is a secret advertisement to get you to download something that's free. Okay. You know, no, it's the, the rubric we're using is to figure out something that someone without, let's say, command line experience can go download, click a couple things, and get up and running as easy as possible. That was for me the goal. Um, knowing a little bit is dangerous, knowing more is even more dangerous. Um, the restriction here is really, and this kind of narrows the field almost automatically. Um, we expect that there'll be more work coming out of Calbox and probably other outfits to make it more UI friendly, but right now if you give me a laptop and I have to show somebody how to put together a site, give them a Drupal 101 tour, that's what I would do. I'd probably do Lando or uh, Doxel or Dev Desktop. Yep. And uh, in the old days, I would recommend like MAMP or XAMPP or something like that. But the big difference is those tools, you install it, and then you have to create a database, and then you have to download Drupal's code base, and you have to follow all these instructions. With Dev Desktop, you click a button and you have a Drupal site. That's, that's kind of the point. Um, yeah? Do you, with tools like Dev Desktop, do you guys? Uh, find that you can get feedback from like integrating with other teams like usually committing stuff to get out of there does that tend to cause any problems or um, I know that when you use dev desktop it, it has that I can't think of the top of my head that particular file but there's like a, um, a dev file that kind of like comes along in your repo and uh, I think I've had some experience where that has caused like some issues and I don't know if maybe that's some of the lack of flexibility that you were talking about like yeah. using like Docsal or Lando. But. Yeah, I, I would say that a lot of people outgrow Dev Desktop. Like a person like Chris has outgrown it, I would say. And, you know, it's, there's a lot of things where it's not the best solution. But if you're getting started in Drupal or if, you're, if you need to get a site built quickly, something like that, and you don't want to worry about the details, that's what it's best for. I want to teach my daughter Drupal. I want to put her on Dev Desktop first. Let her play with that. Yeah. When she gets adventurous, you know, put her on Lando, and then hopefully in like two weeks she'll be doing custom Docker profiles. <laughs> she'll be setting up Kubernetes clusters. Exactly. Uh, so uh, for a single developer, like a one-man team, uh, one, one developer doing, you know, front-end site building, whatever, but somebody who's a little bit more coding-oriented, uh, I would say doing a custom Docker setup, which is what I actually do for most of my, anything outside of Aqua basically, um, is best because A, it's super lightweight and you only have to learn as much as you need to get something running. Uh, and B, there's thousands of guides for how to do something. Like you just need a PHP and uh, Apache and 
MySQL thing and you put them together and mash them up. And there's tons of examples out there. Another option is as you get a little bit more into it, you realize, oh, all these other tools do these things for me that I have to do on my own. So another thing that I do sometimes is I like take the Wadby containers or take Lando or something like that, kind of strip things out that I don't need and then make it really lightweight for myself. Um, but the idea is that uh, Docker is super easy to pick up and can be really flexible and easy. And if you're a single developer, you don't have to worry as much about like making the Docker environments perfect for everyone on your team and making configurations that match your production perfectly and all that. Like you can do those things, um, but uh, it's it's easy to get started. It's super fast and it works on Windows, Mac, and Linux uh, really well nowadays. And I would say it's funny because I maintain Drupal VM, which uses Vagrant. Uh, but I would say avoid if you're if you're just doing small small projects or if you're a single developer contracting that kind of thing and you don't need to share your code base in development environments avoid something like Vagrant uh, just because it's I would I'd say there's more overhead there of having Vagrant and VirtualBox running it uses more resources on your computer so you can't run as many virtual machines at the same time and it's it's Ruby. There's, you don't have to know Ruby, but there's a little bit of Ruby involved. Who wants to know Ruby? You know? <laughs> um, Windows and, 10. Yeah, then we have, the, this is a, a, a good one to get into a little bit because, I don't know, it's in this room, who here uses Windows? So we have a, it's, that's pretty Same normal. Same reflects the, yeah, it's, a, it's a pretty normal distribution, I'd say. Um, at this time, the reason I recommend Drupal VM is because uh, as somebody who's maintained Drupal VM for years, uh, Drupal VM has gone through years and years of making sure things work on Windows. And I literally have a laptop at my house sitting on my desk where every time I do Drupal VM updates, I test it on Windows. You're not going to get that with most of the other solutions right now. Uh, a lot of the Docker solutions are getting there, um, but Docker on Windows is a little different and the way networking works on Windows is a little different. And if you use the Windows subsystem for Linux, it's a little different. So um, right now, I'd say my recommendation is Drupal VM next year. That might change. Uh, but mostly, it's based on the fact that you're, you'll actually get a little bit of support with a lot of other tools. I guess Dev Desktop, too. Yeah. Uh, but when you're on a team, Dev Desktop can have some issues. Yeah. Um, and avoid anything that doesn't support Windows 10, basically. There's there's a lot of good tools out there that will work on Windows, but if you look in their documentation, they say, we support Mac and Linux. And it's like, well, what about Windows? It's like, it works there, but you're going to find that if you open an issue in their issue queue, they'll just close it. Yeah, you'll have dead ends. Yeah, nobody else is using Windows with that tool, so you're not going to get any support. Um, and then for a team of developers doing all Drupal 8 development using a Mac, I would recommend one of the Docker tools. Uh, because they're all getting mature enough now where you can kind of replicate whatever environment you need to. Uh, you can share the configuration in your code base so that everybody can get up and running really quickly. Um, at this point in time, I would say if, if the most important thing is to make your local environment exactly like production, for a lot of cases you might want to use Drupal VM for that because you can tweak literally everything about it. Um, whereas some of the Docker solutions, you can tweak most things but not all things. Uh, some of them are coming up to speed there and getting a, a little better, but at this time, that's the only time I'd say that Drupal VM is like uh, much better than some of the other solutions. Um, but again, anything that slows things down, like I've I've seen a lot of issues where like two developers it works and the third developer it doesn't because their laptop is running whatever this thing is or some proxy or some VPN or whatever. Um, and Vagrant seems to have more issues more often than Docker uh, with a more complex project, like the one that you'd do if you're doing all Drupal 8 and you have a team of developers with front-end tools and Node.js and things like that. For a team, a team of Drupal developers, so let's say there's a small group, we assume that there's probably, it's a group effort to do group administration. But if it's a larger group, let's say 25 or higher, um, where you may or you're likely to have somebody performing sysadmin duties, the, is there any difference in the recommendation that way? Or? Yeah, I would say for the, for the few groups that are bigger than 20, 30, 40 people, um, where you do have, like at Aqua, we have three or four people in our group that uses these tools that do 
DevOpsy things and sysadmin things. Like that's one of the reasons we use Drupal VM is because we can kind of make gear it towards our needs a little bit when we need to and make sure that it works well with tools like BLT and Acquia Cloud and all that. And some of the other tools too, like uh, uh, what is it? Um, Calibox has started out with more of a focus on Pantheon, but it's widened its reach and Lando is now for pretty much everything. Um, a lot of the tools came out of like a dev shop, needed something for themselves, and then they open sourced it. Uh, and if you have enough people, it might make sense for you to f either fork one of those projects and customize it for your shop, or to start with something custom and, and really build it for your needs. There's a lot of the tools, a lot of the long tail tools are things that a dev shop built for themselves. And it's really nice, but it's a little bit tuned to their needs, so it's not as flexible in general as some of the other tools. Yeah. Uh, with this current slide and the all Drupal 8 sort of team, does that take into account like decoupled Drupal 8 apps, people who might be doing like no Yeah, yeah. So in that case, would you say Docker for sure then? I would say same thing. It's It really depends on how closely you want to mirror production. Because like Drupal VM can, can customize all the little fine-tuned bits for every piece of your infrastructure, Node.js and Drupal and Postgres and Nginx and Varnish and hundreds of other things. There are a couple, like I, I don't know, I haven't looked as much into Lando, but a couple of the other Docker solutions do have a lot of tweaks that you can put in. But if it's not going to be the same versions of the same, same kind of infrastructure setup as your production environment, that's the one case where I'd say um, Docker might not yet be the best solution. Uh, but yeah, even if you're doing decoupled Drupal with, with different kinds of tech, I would say Docker is still a good option. Yeah. Um, I'm not familiar with Baker. Can you explain a little bit deeper? We're going to get there. We'll, is it yep. okay, come on. Yeah. I knew that question was coming up. Thank you. <laughs> do you find, so, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so these personas, do you find that, like, this is obviously a good recommendation or a good set of recommendations if people <laughs> sort of uniformly fit in these four buckets, but. What, what do you think when maybe you're working on one big project, which is a development Drupal 8 project on Mac, but you have a couple other people on uh, you know, a V7 site or something else, and I mean, do, you, do you then recommend they adopt a different tool set for each persona, or sort of try to find one that fits across how many personas they may be fitting? I, I would lean towards what your organization is more comfortable with, because you, you know, if you have three developers, let's yeah. say, and two of them are on Windows, one on Mac or something, yeah. Yeah. it's nicer to have a tool that everybody knows and then you can help yeah. each other out. Because there's a, there's a lot of times when like the first time you set up a new project, you have some bug that you can't figure out. And if you have three people using the same thing, they might be like, oh, I found that bug, or oh, I know what to search on Google to figure it out. Uh, but if you have three different tools, each one of you has to do your own research every time that you... So it's safe to say it's the kind of best fit across all I would say, yeah. And it's going to be different for every organization. And the hardest thing would be if you have a lot of different teams, like one team has one developer, one team has five developers, one team has Node.js and Drupal, and the other one is only Drupal. So, and did you go Preston. Oh, well, I just wanted to add um, to your point about the couple Drupal. If you're using something uh, like Reservoir or one of the web services distributions, um, Reservoir, for example, has a Docker container available that you can just pull off and, and uh, uh, go ahead and, and boot up. Um, if you want to learn more, I have a session with the Yeah. Well, and that, that'll bring us, I'll talk more about that in a couple minutes. Yep. yep. Those are slides. Uh, so those were the personas and, and recommendations, uh, but we, I, I mean, the, the basic principles is whatever local development environment you use and you evaluate should make it easy to start a new project. Like you shouldn't have to wrestle it every time that you build a new project. Um, it should make it so that if you get a new developer on your team, they can get up and running, and I would say in an hour or less. If it takes more than an hour, you need to think about using something else. Um, you should also be able to set a global configuration like the PHP version and the Node.js version and uh, the Apache version and all those kind of things. So it should be able to be shared with your team and ideally inside your code base. Uh, at Aqua we have a tool called BLT that does all this stuff and it puts it all in together using Composer and Magic and stuff like that. We'll talk about that at DrupalCon. Dark Magic. Yeah. Um, and then finally, ideally you want to make your local environment be as much as as much like your production environment as you can. 
realizing that you know if, if you're like hosting an Aquia cloud you're not gonna set up like seven VMs and have all these things and load balancers and certificate management stuff and yeah. you know next slide that's the next question yeah why is it important yeah I, the, the most important thing is there's a lot of times when you develop, like if you're one of the majority of developers who the developer does their own testing, or if you pray and what was the other one? <laughs> you cross your fingers. Yeah, cross your fingers, yeah. Hope that you don't <laughs> die. Uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of times, and you, you know, it's the littlest things like updating a module. You update the module, it works fine locally. You push it to production, and then your site dies. I'm like, why did that happen? Oh, we're using PHP 7.1 on the live site, and I'm using 7.0 locally. You know, those kind of things do happen. So, you know, in descending order, I'd say like the PHP version is the most important for Drupal. Um, having Apache or Nginx, if you have that on your server, that's important. Using MySQL or Postgres, there's, who here uses Postgres or even knows what it is? See, okay, so no, there's, there's a couple of people. So, I mean, that's not a, as important, but there's like using the same kind of version range. Like if you're using MySQL 5.5 on your production server, using MySQL 5.7 locally, that's a bad situation because you're going to end up writing a query that works locally, but then when it runs in production, you get a white screen of death. So some of the tools, Lando, Drupal VM, uh, Doxel, uh, Drew, DDDev, yeah, Drud. Some, some of them are better at this than others. Like, yeah. you know, and you'll find that pretty quick. If you read the documentation and it's like, just change these variables and it'll change things. The, some of the tools are better at getting you to that point than others. If it's really, if it's a struggle, it might not be the right fit for you. All right. So now we do a little quick, well, quick. We got a couple minutes to do one on one. We want to tell you what is, right? And who doesn't know what Vagrant is? Let's start with that. Or haven't used it, or kind of roughly. What's the question? Vagrant. Know have, what Vagrant have you heard is. of it? Have you heard of it? Have you heard used of it? it right? Okay. All right. Anybody here using it? Okay. A couple. So for the rest of you. So Vagrant was, it's probably, I don't know, eight or 10 years ago or something. Uh, a lot of people realized like, it's better to use a virtual machine than to install this junk on your laptop. Because if you have Apache and PHP and all this, and you have two projects, what if one project needs PHP 7 and one project needs PHP 5.6? Now you need to like do weird things to set up virtual environments inside your laptop with Voodoo magic, and then you end up screwing up your laptop, and then you got to wipe your entire laptop and go back. So people were like, oh, there's this thing called VirtualBox, and it creates a virtual machine running Ubuntu or running some form of Linux, and then I can install Apache and stuff in there and keep a nice separate separation of all my project stuff from my laptop. And then, oh, I can also take this stuff that I just built and put it on my friend's computer. So we both have the same exact identical environment. The problem with the original way that was is every single person had to like install VirtualBox and then like install a virtual machine and then go in there and type in a thousand commands and install things on it. So Vagrant managed those virtual machines. Vagrant makes it so that you can like define uh, either a shell script or Ansible playbooks or chef cookbooks or whatever kind of automation that you want. And you say like, I want Apache, I want MySQL, I want Linux, and I want uh, PHP. A recipe. Yeah. PHP is important for Drupal. Um, you, you want those things, and then you save a file on, in your code base, and then any developer can run Vagrant up, and it builds that for them. So it was like, it, it's the same model that Docker uses, it's just it takes a little longer usually because it has to do the things unless you pre-build a, a base box for yourself. But Vagrant makes it so that you can build isolated environments for your Drupal site um, on any laptop. And it works well with Windows, Mac, and, and uh, Linux. Another advantage for Vagrant is it has a really mature networking model where if you want to do things like have custom host names for your sites, have custom DNS, have your site available on the public internet or just on your computer, uh, have it like pick IP addresses from your local network, do all these different things. Like It, it, it does all that pretty automatically. Uh, that's one thing where it has a little bit of an advantage right now for Docker still. Docker has its own internal network that's a little different and doesn't work the same on Mac, Windows, and Linux. So like, you have something that works on your Linux laptops, you send it over your Mac laptops, and it doesn't work there, and you're like, what's going on? Uh, so that's Vagrant. It builds an entire copy of a virtual computer inside your computer. So it's a little heavyweight, but it, it let you have isolated environments, and you can just delete it if you messed it up, and you wouldn't affect your laptop. 
Docker is the same kind of thing, uh, but instead of having a full virtual environment with a full network card and sound card and USB ports and all that attached to it, Docker kind of threw away all the things that, it, that are not necessarily necessary for running a, a separate environment inside your environment and really messing up the technical part of it, but this is what Docker does. It basically bundles up everything without all the junk that VirtualBox adds in to make like a completely virtualized computer. A more streamlined simulation. Yeah, and, and it, 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 uh, it also lets you do things like uh, build layers on top of your Docker images instead of, instead of having to rebuild an entire machine every time. Uh, you can just say like, I just want to change out the code base in my Docker container. In the real world, a lot of times they're very similar in the way that you build things if you do it all custom. Um, but Docker is faster usually for getting things set up because a lot of times the things you need are already pre-built and you don't have to install things yourself as much. My spell checker just changed Docker to Rocket. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, you know, sometimes it's that fast. So. <laughs> uh, and then another thing that I, Chris was asking me, do I want to leave this in, do I not? Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Composer, even though it's not strictly part of a local development environment, uh, but I think that in the next year or two, it, it's been a long journey for Drupal 8 and Composer to be friendly with each other. In the beginning, it was really rough, and there was a session at DrupalCon last year that kind of showed a lot of different things that people were having trouble with. Um, and so a lot of those things are ironed out, like how do you get Node.js stuff in your Drupal project for front-end development, and how do you how do you get custom modules, and how do you integrate patches from Drupal core and things like that. A lot of those issues have been ironed out, but one thing that I think will be happening uh, over the next year or two is um, environment, like your local environment, will be a dependency of your project. So. You know, when you build a new project, instead of downloading Drupal VM or downloading Dev Desktop or downloading Lando and then like downloading Drupal code and then downloading other things, you'll just create a composer Drupal project. Like say, I want a new Drupal project and I want to use Drupal VM. And then it'll all just kind of magically wire itself together. Composer can do all this stuff and it makes it a lot more simple to get up and running. Uh, and Drupal VM, the next version will be a composer plugin. So. It'll literally be, you have a Drupal project and you want to add Drupal VM, you say Composer, add plugin or whatever it is, Drupal VM, and then it will configure everything for you. And then you can modify it if you want, but um, it'll make it easier to, to integrate the local environment with your project without having to do a bunch of things like move files around or download something. Nice. Yes, uh, yeah, this was always a question, you know, uh, in the end this goes back to the Windows 7 or Windows 10. Um, both of us have been on projects together um, together and separately where the customer uh, development team has Windows developers, both 7 or 10, um, and it, it, it is, there's a number of factors uh, that go into it, you know, with the skill set of the developer, how advanced of a Drupal developer they actually are, um, you know, where they're coming from a for example, .NET or ASP background, or are they have they been doing Drupal development for a while? Um, as well as the complexity of the site, is there a lot of custom work that's been done that's been added, as opposed to a site that's been built mostly on contributed modules? Um, we've seen kind of both ends of the spectrum, where we came into one customer that was initially Windows. Now they're doing all their development on Macs. They halfway through the project, they said forget it, we're just getting max, it's way easier. Running the numbers, the time spent to debug the environments in Windows, it was cheaper to buy brand new Macs <laughs> for the dollar amount. And you have to look at it that way. It, uh, you laugh, but when I run the numbers and I put it in front of the decision maker, it's a very clear decision. Um, there's issues about you know network and IT security, whatever the, if especially if it's a larger enterprise, but generally they can be accommodating. Um, equally um, present is the situation where customers have Windows developers, like I said, they're Windows 10, they're savvy, they can, they can manage, they have it down, they have a, a, a solution, they're using uh, Docker, they're using VM, uh, Drupal VM, and it works, it, you know, as long as things don't break, right, the P a major PHP release or a uh, change in Aqua VLT, sometimes that you have to go back and reconstruct everything, um, but that's 
healthy progress. I'm going to let you talk more about that. Yeah, and you had a question first. Why don't they just put Arch on their workstations? <laughs> <laughs> She's being an Arch troll. Up there. <laughs> No, it's, Shut up. It's, I, I, I spent a lot of time working on uh, Windows support in Drupal VM, probably three, four hundred hours at this point. And I, I bought with my personal money, not Aquia money, a PC laptop just to be able to test these things. Like, as I said, it, you're not going to get that level of support from most projects. And I don't even know why I did I think I did that because I actually started on Windows 10, no, Windows 8. Uh, a few years ago with one of my first bigger Drupal projects and so I felt the pain and I have this, have yes. this uh, attraction to pain I guess I don't know but you know just realize that going into it and um, you know if you're on Windows and you you don't have the, the resources in your team to do DevOps things or have people that can debug issues and things like that it could be it could be painful enough that you might want to consider getting a Mac or installing Linux on one of the PCs or doing something like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's obviously, you know, a cheaper alternative and especially if you're a small shop and it is not a, an easy thing to do. Um, going the virtual route is probably a better solution. Or do Arch Linux. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, last topic, I don't know if we want to still cover it. We got a we got a minute or two. Well yeah, we have a couple minutes. I'll I'll just run through it really quick. Um, some of the development environments have their own kind of integration set up for deploying things to production, or they have integrations like Acquia BLT uh, integrates with Drupal VM so that you can do some stuff on local and then you run a command and it pushes it up to Acquia Cloud. You could probably modify it to push to other places. I know Lando has like recipes for Acquia Cloud and for Pantheon mm -hmm. and a few others, platform maybe, and, mm -hmm. um, and they make it easier to do those kind of things. Um, and so that's something to consider when you're looking at these tools. Like, if your hosting provider really recommends one, you might want to use that just to make life easier for you, um, as long as it solves all your other needs too. Yeah, please don't fix your code on production. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. Anyway, that's it. Yeah. So I guess let's open it up to questions. If anybody has anything, I'm sure you have questions. Sure, yes. sir. Yeah. The reason I don't use uh, Arch. And uh, my Windows machine <laughs> is I used to have a real job until I got fired for being old. Mm -hmm. And uh, I couldn't find an interview to get a job, so I started a solo practice. And I do uh, Windows DevOps for a number of small businesses. IBM's definition of a small business is under $100 million or 1,000 employees. <laughs> Mine's a couple decimal points over. I'm the IT staff, I'm the CIO. And the DevOps team and everything else. So I know how to do DevOps. And uh, they need Windows. And uh, I could uh, give lots of reasons why I don't like Windows. But uh, my clients, a small business, they want to run QuickBooks. They want to run AutoCAD. And uh, they have no choice but a Windows environment. Yep. So uh, my development machines are Windows. So that's a majority of my practice yep. and I'm a lightweight uh, Drupal developer and I really thought uh, Dev Desktop was great on Windows. The only problem with it is sometimes it goes out to lunch and you got to restart it and sometimes you got to reboot and uh, one time when it was a really inconvenient time not even rebooting after I made a minor change to a theme from the uh, Drupal U simple Drupal web page, nothing would happen. It was completely dead. And then I started looking around and I found a lot of people who agree that Apache is a piece of crap on Windows. <laughs> and uh, PHP works really well. It had issues in version 5 that were worse than 64-bit, but version 7 works on Windows. Yep. And uh, PHP 7 works, MySQL works uh, before the 5720 installer. If you try to install uh, Windows uh, MySQL, it did not install all of the DLLs that it needed. Sometimes it installed wrong ones, but you could work around that, and once you got it installed, it worked. And the current 5.7.20 uh, installer does work. So PHP and MySQL work. Then the only problem is a number of people all agree that Apache it doesn't work. 
and a number of other people said that IAS is the only web server that does work on Windows. <laughs> so I looked into it. Uh, there is a uh, website called Drupal 8 on Windows or something like that. Yep. And uh, they document how to get IIS to work. And uh, I had some good results with that. I did not know about Drupal VM. I'll give that a try. Yeah, so I was going to say, you sound like an advanced, well, not advanced, but not a beginner developer. I I'm would, an advanced. I, a be advanced a beginner. DevOps guy and a beginner is So I, I skew you to pass the, and I'm sure Jeff will, will back me on this. I'd say you're probably ready to move past Dev Desktop and to try uh, Drupal VM. Um, my other question is, is the, the importance of mimicking the server environment, meaning your local is running ISS. What is your, what's the actual site living on? Is that on a Windows it's on server? A it's on a LAMP server. Right. And, uh, Matching MySQL and PHP seems to work. And uh, IIS doesn't have an HD access. Yeah, yeah, so, there's, uh, a, there's a lot of... There's minor configuration. <laughs> and but uh, once, you get, uh, once you get IIS to, uh, to do PHP, which is not... <coughs> yeah. It's uh, pretty easy. I, I've had trivial uh, reconfiguration that was obvious moving from IIS to Apache as long as I have the right version of MySQL and uh, PHP. Yeah, and, and that's something we didn't really cover too much in this presentation, but there are a large number of developers who basically do run everything local. Like, there's a guy at, at Acquia who always, like, he's always making fun of Drupal VM because he's like, why not just install Apache on your Mac? And why not just install this? It's like... Yeah, I did it, that in Drupal 6, not now. Okay. It, yeah. it, it does it does work, but you do run into issues where sometimes there might be something like HD access could cause issues when you deploy to production and you have a difference in your IIS configuration right. that you know you didn't you didn't notice. But if you're if you're a developer who can manage it, it's not the end of the world. If you're on a large team of developers and you're the only one doing it, that's that's one case where it, it can be a major problem. And you know sometimes we're like. Look, you know, get in line. We have five developers. They're all using this thing. None of them have a problem. You have tons of problems. You're doing your very customized setup. Just, just use the same thing as everyone else. And they're like, okay, I'll do it. And then you find out, oh, hey, I don't have this problem anymore. You know. Yeah. So, but if you, you know, for me, I if if I weren't as much into DevOps, I'd probably just have like MAMP or do you know do a local environment thing. If I were just doing a site or two. Since I work at Acquia and we do tons of sites and I'm always switching things, I have to use either a VM or Docker because otherwise I just mess up my computer all the time. As opposed to a, a solo shop that yeah. works on one site at a time. Exactly. Yep. It's it's a big difference. And uh, you mentioned uh, Windows Subsystem for Linux. It mm -hmm. is growing. It's really impressive now. It does have some issues. Yeah. The Fall Creators update uh, removed the word beta from its title. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it still has some issues. It's still beta. I don't think it's, it's, ready. Yeah. it's not Despite ready for prime time, although someday it might be. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of real smart people working on it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, go for it. Yeah, um, I saw the survey out. I should have I just suggested this at the time. And I know, first of all, thank you. These types of uh, data analysis is great, especially if you run them yearly so you can see uh, trends. Did you? Um, and I don't think I saw this in the data, but we didn't, you didn't ask about hosting provider makeup they people use? No, I didn't ask about hosting provider, and my question was, do you use dev stage and prod? You know, that, yeah. that's another question. Because I know like this like high correlation from like Panthic and Calibox, and obviously yep. Drupal via Aquia, et cetera. Uh, and back to the question I asked earlier, which is, you know, do you fit in the multiple personas of buckets and therefore find a tool that best fits across them? Um, you know, having come from an agency, sometimes the client detects the hosting provider. Yep. Like, you have to use Aquia or you have to use or, yeah. I could use my GoDaddy account. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. I'd be very curious to see if you were able to tease out correlations. I know you can't rerun the survey this year, but. Yeah. No, no, but for future, yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. That's good. And if, if anybody else has any questions uh, or feedback you want to pass along, please please let me know. Also, um, if you know of anybody who hasn't taken the survey between now and Nashville in a couple of weeks, let them know because well, I'm going to continue aggregating uh, for the next few weeks. Can you, can you send a tweak a link or something? Yeah, yeah, I'll post them. Um, so when um, once the recording is done, I, I go back and transcribe slides and add note slides, and I'll put the details in. The PDF will be posted on the MidCamp site. Great, thank you. You had a question. I yeah. do have a question. So this sure. might be out of the scope of what you're talking about today, but um, I think it pertains to local development in general. 
Um, I'm someone who's pretty new to Drupal, so do you have any recommended tools for debugging? So these could be things either in the browser or uh, modules that you can add on to a Drupal install that you would recommend? Like backend? Yes, yeah. right. so you're, you're building a custom module, it's yeah. not working, or you don't know what variables you have access to. Yeah. What do you recommend for that? The name of the game is xDebug, yeah. and uh, it's it integrates with PHP Storm, Sublime Text, some other things, so that okay. you can basically save a file, go to the page, refresh it, and it'll pop up all the debugging information. Awesome. And set breakpoints and stuff. Um, Drupal VM supports it out of the box. Lando does. Almost all the major ones do now. Some of them might not, but it's uh, if you need to install it on your own, it's not too hard. It's a PHP extension you install. Okay. Cool. Yeah, but that's uh, industry standard. What do you call it? Yeah, every yeah. It, it's what everybody uses basically. Yeah. And there's a model here that we play. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. If you're doing theming work, right? <laughs> Very cool. Very handy. Uh, other questions? Sorry. Yes. So, uh, Drupal VM has, I believe, some deeper beneficial or like beta support for Docker. But it seems like you're recommending things like Mendo instead of that. And I'm just curious. That's mostly because. I, so the Drupal VM Docker stuff is very selfishly developed just for me. I wanted a quick Drupal environment that I could build. Like I have 20 something personal sites and small business things from way before Acquia time that I maintain still, most of them Drupal 7. And I wanted to have like literally um, like Docker Compose up and three seconds later I'm doing development because I hated the whole like spending five minutes waiting to be able to make one change to a theme or update one module and check it. So that, I mainly developed it for my personal use doing that, uh, but it does have support for building one container with all of your customizations, and then you can either stay that container or if your team like put it up on Docker Hub or put it somewhere where you can share it. Uh, that, that's one thing a little different with Drupal VM's approach as to many of the other approaches. It's like one VM, one container with everything. So you have like a 500 megabyte or 800 megabyte container. Uh, with some of the other tools, you have like 20 containers or seven containers, one for PHP, one for MySQL, one for something else. Um, technically speaking, the other approach is more Docker-like and all that. But in my opinion, if you're not running Docker in production, there's no reason to make things more complicated than they have to be. That's just my personal opinion, and many people would attack me for it. <laughs> no, I'm with you. Keep it but simple. I build things that I'm work, sure that and I build things that are easy to maintain. And sometimes those things don't reflect the exact perfection that some people envision with Docker. I want it easy to maintain. Yes. Yep. If, if you're running a website for six years, you don't want to have to spend you know, hours every year, every time that Docker updates a major version, redoing all the networking because everything changed again. Which to, to change the cover here. <laughs> Person for low skilled work. Yeah. That's why you're here. <laughs> Any other questions? Does the first time I've heard Docker on Windows, does it work? Mm -hmm. It works pretty well. The, the only thing that sometimes can throw you off is the networking. It's the same thing with the Mac. Docker was Docker's built on Linux stuff. Right. Like things that are essential to parts of Linux, C groups and things like that, and jails and all that. Um, Windows doesn't have that out of the box, so Docker builds its own little virtualization layer and then does Docker stuff inside of it. Same thing on a Mac. Uh, so the main difference that you'll find between Mac, Linux, and Windows is when you do networking and do IP addresses and things like that. If you, if you try doing some of that stuff, you'll find that it behaves differently in different places. Um, but actually, running a Docker container is pretty simple now on Windows running most of these environments works out of the box. But like I said, some of them have no support for Windows. Yeah. So, you know, they don't even have instructions for, if you're on Windows, download Windows or Docker for Windows. They just say, like, if you're on Mac, do this. If you're on Linux, do that. Right. Like, oh, okay, I guess you don't care. And yeah, Lando runs on Docker? What's that? Lando runs on Docker. Yeah, Lando's yep. on Docker. Most, most of the tools that we've uh, had in the survey are Docker-based. It seems like the world is kind of moving that way just because it's usually faster, easier, quicker. And uh, kind of like in Drupal 8, we have like a thousand libraries and dependencies we throw into something to make it easier. With Docker, you can just take everybody's potentially insecure infrastructure code and just throw it in a container and put it out there. But if you do Docker in production, it's a lot different story than Docker in culture environments. Awesome. All right.
Thank you, everybody.